Hi, I'm Michel Bayan, and welcome to The Source DS. Hello out there. Welcome to The Source DS podcast. My guest today is the Chief Commercial Officer of Legal Shield, James Rousseau. What a really amazing executive. I think you guys are going to love this conversation. I know you guys know that I, by now, that I kind of think Legal Shield's an amazing company. This is the third one of their executives that I've had on the podcast now. They're just such a progressive example of what direct selling companies can be and are moving towards already. Um, James is going to, as you're going to hear him share a lot of amazing things about his experience, how he got into direct selling, how they've been able to improve member retention by 20%. And a lot of really interesting stuff that they've been doing and finding about the data that they have. And a lot of our companies are even just beginning to think about the value of our data, but we think of it still in terms of the value to ourselves. Now, Legal Shield is doing that. But interestingly enough, what they also thought about was, hey, what is this data in terms of its value? What kind of value can we give to society and does our, our data have any of that? And they found that, in fact, their data really does. Um, so they released a thing called the Legal Shield Law Index, which I will uh, make you wait <laughs> to hear about, um, which is really fascinating about how their data are, is really leading indicators to a whole bunch of economic measuring points. Really, really interesting stuff. And uh, then, you know, we, you know, we do the same personal questions to really get to know people all the time. I think you'll find some really interesting things about James and how he handles work-life balance and uh, some of the journey he's been through um, as a man and as an executive. So I hope you guys will enjoy this conversation about Legal Shield and with Legal Shield's C- Chief Commercial Officer, James Rousseau. Thanks. Okay, James Rousseau, really nice to have you here, man. Welcome to the Source DS podcast. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. So you come from a really interesting background, having started, uh, you know, in, in both in, back in finance and then moving into the insurance space, and now in a direct selling company with uh, Legal Shield. Tell us a little bit about how you found direct selling and your know, your first kind of plunge into it. How are you finding it, and you know what's keeping you here? Gotcha. Got well. You know, it's been three and a half years now, and um, it was a it was a great match. So to your point, you know, I spent eleven years at J.P. Morgan Chase, and during that time. Was pretty much direct to consumer sales. I spent um, my last uh, three or four years there in, in uh, partnership marketing on the credit card side of the house, and through partnerships, marketing credit cards. And I went to Allstate for uh, about three years as president of uh, Affinity there. And there is where I re- really spent a lot more time thinking about how to work with agencies. And so the the one misnomer I had when when I came into direct selling was that working with associates uh, would be the same as working with agencies. I was wrong. I was totally wrong. Right. Um, there are a lot of similarities, but there are, mm-hmm. I think, more differences and similarities. What I've come to appreciate is that you have a much stronger portion of people who are part time. And with that comes some of the challenges or, or, or think or opportunities to think about how you keep those folks engaged. Right. And, um, you know, kind of have them go through the business and graduate over time through different levels through the business. Totally different experience. And so what I would say is, one, it's a perfect match for me because I love the process of helping people find their opportunity as an entrepreneur. Secondarily, I love watching people grow and develop. And one of the things that I appreciate so much about direct selling is that personal development is a big part of the business model. So I, I really come to enjoy it. I can imagine your first big Legal Shield event must have been quite an experience. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, <laughs> not quite what I expected. Uh, you know, uh, direct sellers are, are, are a little bit more uh, creative than uh, insurance agents. So, yeah, I've, I've learned a lot over three and a half years for sure. It's amazing to see all the stories of people who, you know, these opportunities, you know, how much their lives are impacted. Yes, absolutely. And so, and I was, sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, I was thinking about, you know, you mentioned the word affinity, and, you know, I, I know a little bit about how hard you guys are working at Legal Shield to create really great experiences for both the associates and the customers. And uh, I want to, can you talk to us a little bit about that? You know, most, most companies in the space are really new to even just paying much attention to customers at all. Uh, many companies are kind of running to create a customer only kind of classification to be able to separate the people who are really sellers from the people who are really buyers, you know, um, and you guys are focused much more on, you guys have had customers for ages. So it's really right. more about really providing that level of experience and you're using digital tools. And can you tell us a little bit about the, let's start with maybe the overall philosophy around customer experience at Legal Shield, and then some of the specifics of what kinds of experiences you guys are creating for people? 
Absolutely. And I think to do that, you know, and I'll try not to belabor it, but it, I have to say it this way in order for it to really make sense and give you the substance. I mean, at the end of the day, Legal Shield provides equal access to justice and to a certain extent, social justice. Right. So if you just think about that, right, access to justice, when you look at most reports, uh, I, I will give you an example. The American Bar Association did a study last year in a com- uh, and, and put a commission together on the future legal trends. One of the most sobering statements was that annually 100 million people go without having civil legal needs addressed. Right. And, and the mm-hmm. points we try to make of that, you know, when you look at the legal system and we didn't say it, this is, you know, a group of our peers, people who work in the legal profession say legal services are typically not affordable, not excessive, uh, excessive rather, not responsive and not accountable. Right. And so let's just start with accessibility and affordability. We exist to make that possible right through the model that we've built. So when you start with that kind of mission orientation, as you go to the market in a certain in a service capacity, we spend a lot of time thinking about the product and that member experience, right? Because it's not a one-time usage category and it's not a, it's not a consumable, it's a service. It's an interaction with a law firm, right? That we are, have pledged to you is going to act on your behalf to have her handle matters from, you know, we sometimes we say from the trivial to the traumatic in real terms from traffic tickets and moving violations up through, it could be including your state planning, managing through a divorce. I mean, you think about dealing with landlord tenant issues and consumer finance issues, all of those issues have varying levels of complexity. So we spend a lot of time thinking about the product or the service, if you will, from what that member's experience is going to be like. The first time they dial their law firm in their state, what will the interaction feel like? How will the process feel like? And oftentimes, I mean, you know this, right? Every legal matter is not necessarily going to have an outcome in the member's favor. Even then, they should feel like they were well represented, right? And that they were treated with the utmost respect, so on and so forth. So we spend a ton of time thinking about the product. That's awesome. And and I know that you guys have launched like a legal uh, legal shield app. Maybe was that a couple of years ago now where people can Correct. you know, ask questions and gain direct access to their law firm. I remember I've been a Legal Shield member myself for, you know, ever. And uh, I remember back in the day, like I had to make a phone call and like kind of wait on hold and then get to a person and then wait for someone to call me back. It seems like you guys are are making that process a lot more efficient. Absolutely. So we, you know, we we operate in a very agile way. We call ourselves a 45-year-old startup and the reason we do that is because we we don't believe we're ever done, right? We're continuously trying to think about how we evolve the business. And when you think about the proliferation of mobile technology, right, it it's nonstop. And so we think about our mobile app in the same way. We are constantly bringing improvements. So a year plus ago, it was we added a feature called Snap that allows our members, uh, in, the, in the case of a moving violation, to take a picture of their ticket right then, put in a few critical pieces of information, and then it goes right to their law firm so their law firm can begin to act on their behalf. And we, we're not in the business of fixing tickets, but what happens is when a lawyer gets involved, it can help reduce some of the issues that could come, right, in terms of points and potential license suspension and things like that. So that's one thing we've done. To your point, we uh, added a uh, app to our portfolio called Ask a little while ago, and the Ask mobile app allows you to go into that app and ask a number of questions. Again, consumer finance, landlord, tenant, you name it. Should I have a will? Why should I have a will? And you'll get a a very responsible answer. And in many cases, you'll also be given some advice around, look, you know, advice is one thing. Having someone act on your behalf is another thing. We'll always welcome you to our community to become a member. But that's a great example of where the Ask app is free to anyone who wants to use it. You don't have to have a a legal shield membership to use it. And so we're continuing to do that with our app. We just added this very week uh, an extension where you can now use forms about legal shield. We had another way uh, you could do that prior to called shake, which is a company we acquired back in 2015, but now it's now forms by legal shield. So same thing. You can go in there, select your state, use a host of forms to get things done. We know how critical uh, it is to interact with state agencies, so on and so forth. Uh, and so that's what the service provides. And we'll just continue to grow it. You can now start your will and actually get your will done on our mobile app. Answer the questionnaire, get it done, hit the send button. It goes to the law firm. They'll start preparing a will on your behalf and get it ready for your execution. I got to do that myself. I got to update mine. I actually did my first one with Legal Shield many years ago, but it's time for an update. It sounds like it's going to be a lot easier. Absolutely. 
Yeah, really cool stuff. I mean, I, I would imagine that, you know, in addition to creating a better customer experience, you're also gaining a lot of efficiencies. You know, the call centers are usually one of the main expenses that a direct selling company has. And uh, are you noticing an impact by a lot of this kind of self-service technology? We are. We are. And one of our, you know, our aspirations is for our contact centers or call centers to continue to step into higher levels of service for our customers, right? So as any traditional call center model, you have, you know, varying degrees of calls or tiers you manage through. And so what we've begun to do is put, to your very good point, more self-service on certain things that are are simpler to answer and less complex, allowing our uh, customer service agents to really be available for the more complex calls, so on and so forth. So absolutely. And, you know, we introduced uh, bots. So on our websites, we have chat bots. Her name is Aaron <laughs> and Aaron will interact with you, right? Answering your questions. And we just continue to grow that knowledge base that allow, allows Aaron to become more and more helpful to both our members and our direct selling associates. Yeah. I mean, that's the future too. You know, chat bots are getting more and more intelligent, more and more empathetic. You know, they, they're feeling more and more you know, trustworthy. And in some cases, people are, are, will confide more in a chatbot than they will in a, in a human. <laughs> right. Exactly. So th- what I'm really interested in is, is this balance that direct selling companies have to strike between how much of the customer experience uh, of the responsibility of providing a great customer experience does the company take into their own hands and how much of it is left in the hands of their associates? And mm-hmm. where is the balancing act between the two. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how Legal Shield sees that and where you guys are striking those balances? Uh, absolutely. So, you know, one thing I would say is I'm not sure there's a, a statement I can pull out or a declaration, but we always think of the member first. And I think that's a, you know, when I think about the way we're structured and the way we interact with our field of uh, direct selling associates, it's a high level of collaboration, right? Both uh, in the substance as well as, you um, and how we work together. Right. I I think, you know, one of the things we've thought about is, you know, how do we make sure as we talk with direct selling associates, we, we talk about the value of the member and what they should experience, right. From the time they're first introduced, whether it's through a mobile app, uh, we have a mobile app called prospect that our associates use to help manage their business that allows them to invite a a prospective member into a, a campaign, see a video, see a piece of collateral, et cetera, from the time they do that to they, whether they come to a meeting, they sign up, et cetera, how we work together to make sure that process works fluidly and how we retain them for a long time as a membership. So what I would say is, you know, you, I don't think you'd find a chart that says this is the associate's responsibility and this is corporate's responsibility versus a, a conscious stream of thought around this is what the member should experience. Right. And that that's what we've done to date. And so really, in many cases, it sounds like it might even be up to the member, you know, if they want to use a tool and rock and roll, you know, pick up the app and go for it. And if they want to call their associate and and go through that, then go for it. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think that, you know, this is a changing trend in the space where, you know, the the, the sort of the traditional thinking of the model was, well, oh, you know, our, our reps are responsible for customer acquisition and they're also responsible for, you know, customer service. But we don't really have a lot of data to see what types of customer service they're actually doing or, you know, in the case of a prospecting tool like you guys have any analytics to see, well, how are they performing? How good is anyone at actually selling? What's their conversion rate? You know, how many touch points does it take to make a sale? Right. And giving you guys kind of the data of like, you know, I would imagine that gives you data on like where you need to train people more and what area, you know, maybe what teams are better at what aspect of a sale and stuff like that. Do you guys get cool analytics on that? Not as many as you just talked about. <laughs> and, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a little more I, aspirational, I know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and I applaud, I applaud the work you're doing, right? When I listen to you talk about some of the things you're doing at your company, um, that, that they're inspiring. I would say, you know, we, we have a, a certain level of data that we look at exactly some of the things you've talked about, right? How does um, new folks who enter our company, for example, uh, as new associates, what does their success track look like? Those who who uh, perform certain activities within a certain uh, let's call them a new period of time. And do they hit levels at the uh, expected rates that we we think they should? If not, what's going on, so on and so forth. And so to your point, we have ways we look at uh, both from a lineage perspective uh, across our different platinums, from a new associate entrance perspective, and, and whether it's geographically through lineage, et cetera, we absolutely, we look at all those things to try to get more folks into success. Over the last two years, 
we've done a lot of work in terms of uh, our competent incentive programs, as every company would, I'm sure, or are doing, and to make sure there's the right balance between core-based compensation as well as incentives and trips. And we found that, you know, that mix makes a, a big difference, right? Particularly uh, when you think about new entrants coming into the company. As an example, you know, one of the, one of the aspirational things is going on the big trip, right? And whether it's Jamaica or Cancun, so on and so forth, one of the things we did last year for, as an example, is introduce a quarterly trip. And that way, it's almost like no matter when you join the company, you're no more than, than five months or so away from the next trip, right? So you get the opportunity coming inside to go, wow, if I start performing well right now, I just signed up as a new associate, I could be in Cancun in four or five months with the rest of the team. And so, you know, we've continuously done things like that to inspire and motivate our associates. And you're noticing a, like a kind of a, that that actually ends up being a driver for new people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Really cool. Yeah, that's great. You know, anything that they can do. I mean, most companies will find that like that first kind of 90 days of what happens in the life of an associate really does in many cases kind of spell the destiny of where, of where they're going to end up. Yes. You know, we, we look at those numbers pretty, pretty aggressively. And there's without a doubt a, a major difference between those who uh, start their business fast and we call it level up qualifying uh, versus those who do not. Big difference. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So you guys, it sounds like you guys are getting, you know, you've been, I know over the last few years, you've been getting more and more sophisticated with data. You've been in, introducing tools that are providing you guys with more data and more insights. Can you share maybe one or two kind of interesting lessons that, that looking at data has taught you guys, maybe something that, you know, was a blind spot or something that you didn't even, you hadn't even considered before. And then, and then all of a sudden these, you know, some analytic or some data comes up and you're like, wow. Yeah, it's probably more on the product focus side, right? We started taking uh, a harder look at um, member retention and how do we get members to stay longer. And we, I would say over the last three years, have improved member retention by at least 20 percent, right, in terms of duration of stay. Wow. And that was all data data driven, right? Looking at some of the reasons people stay, whether it's uh, and, and I, you know, one, one piece is usage. We highly promote usage, right? You're coming into a company again that provides access to the legal system, right? And what we want to make sure you do is take advantage of that access. And there's a big difference in member retention from those who do and those who don't. And even with those who do, what type of uses they have. And so we train on usage to make sure the members are paying a monthly fee to use the service. Our model's built on, uh, it's a capitated model built on people uh, having a subscription with us. And so we advise usage, right? And as they have interactions with attorneys, there's a direct correlation to how long they stay with us. And so that was one major data point in looking at now how we segment usage. We, uh, when, when members call us, we divide things into what we call 70 unique areas of law. So we understand what they do. And by the way, we don't have to violate attorney client privilege to do that is categor- categorically done. And then we look at those things and over time can watch which behaviors drive both satisfaction and uses. And that's the second thing I would talk about. So one is, again, getting to more uses. The second one is satisfaction. Mm -hmm. We implemented Net Promoter Score about two years ago now, I believe it was. And Net Promoter Score is a commonly used uh, metric and across a number of industries to understand what your customers say about your service. And we've been able to grow that score year over year, quarter upon quarter for the last at least uh, 18 months. And so we're pretty proud of that. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like there's so many insights that you guys can get. And wow, I didn't, I never even thought that there could be 70 different categories of law. So you guys yeah. are getting, that's kind of, I don't know if that's exciting or scary, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but I mean, that that's like kind of a perfect segue into uh, the recent release I saw from you guys, the Legal Shield Law Index. I mean, that kind of blows my mind. You know, I think a lot of companies in direct selling, might even have uh, their own kind of version of this and never even thought of it that, you know, all the data that they're collecting about the behaviors of their people are not only saying something about their business, but are actually saying something about our society. Right. And uh, can you talk a little bit about that? What is the Legal Shield Law Index? Absolutely. So, you know, here's the story. We, We took our data going back to 2002 and really, you know, went to an outside uh, economist group and asked them, you know, are there things about our data we should be thinking about differently? Right? Are there things that will give us some insights into the economy, as it were, or, or you know, so on and so forth? And even pointed to a couple of things. You know, how does this look against the consumer confidence index, and maybe how does it look against the Wells Fargo housing index, et cetera? An economist group came back and said, you know, wow, there 
there are strong correlations here on a number of different points. And just to give you some context, you know, in the course of a year, we will take over 1.6 million calls from our members through the law firms. That's not even including the customer service calls. That, those are intakes that people are calling about. Well, 1.6 million calls, you have a pretty robust data set, right? And so what we did is the economist firm looked at it and said there's strong correlations. They hold, they created standard deviation from 2002, rolled it forward, took it through the business cycle of 07 and 08. And here's the one of the bigger points is that they also found that it was leading information, meaning that we would have called, for example, the business cycle in 07, 08, a little bit ahead of time than the consumer confidence index would. Why? Because our data is actual usage, which we would call hard data, versus a lot of the other uh, indices are based off surveys, right? And survey is about intent. What we're talking about is about usage. I am calling to say I'm going to start my bankruptcy. I'm calling to say uh, I have a foreclosure happening, right? I'm calling to say uh, I'm going to buy a house, et cetera. So both from a, a consumer financial stress perspective, that's the name of our first composite index, the major index we talk about most. You know, it includes calls about bankruptcies and foreclosures and estate planning and trust, so on and so forth. And we found that our consumer financial stress index now over the past four months has been leading consumer confidence, has been indicative of the things we thought we'd hear from Yellen which she went before she went to conference. And just three weeks ago, interestingly enough, after we had been saying this for three months, the University of Michigan, uh, Michigan came out with a consumer confidence study and said, yes, you know what? Uh, <laughs> uh, consumer confidence is overstated. And then we have predicted that earlier. And we also predicted that it's going to be a tougher back half of the year for retail sales, right? Because if financial stress is up, confidence is down and I'm going to probably spend less, right? And retail came out the day after that and said, yeah, Retail sales are going to be uh, somewhat, in a, you know, we're going to have to take forecasts down for retail sales for the back half of the year. So it's been really exciting. Not that we want bad news to happen, of course, but that we want to be of service to provide to the market these economic index. So over the past uh, 30 days, I'll just give you a roundup here and tell you, you know, one, we've been out in road shows. Uh, Barron's has picked it up just yesterday. The Huffington Post picked it up. Uh, we've been spending time with a bunch of uh, government agencies in D.C., as well as members of Congress walking through this. Two weeks ago, I was in um, San Francisco. I had a wonderful time with the uh, Conference of Western Attorneys General, sell, uh, sharing this with them and with everyone, uh, offering it a service as a foreshadowing indicator of the economic markets. Yeah, amazing. I mean, I think that's so, so fascinating and cool. And, and I think we're going to see over the coming years more and more companies, you know, in and out of direct selling, creating, taking their data and turning it into things just like what you guys have done. It's really, really forward thinking. Congratulations. Awesome work. Oh, thank you very much. And it's a big team effort, a number of people I could thank, but a huge team effort uh, from the legal shit team. For sure. For sure. And that kind of leads me. It's interesting because you guys are seeing these leading indicators and uh, we have been seeing this kind of decline of retail, you know, and, and part of it might be economically driven. Part of it might be the, you know, the disruptive force of Amazon and e-commerce in general. And that's also, you know, kind of playing, a ta uh, costing a toll on the direct selling channel itself. Um, last year in the United States, you know, was the first year in a bunch of years that direct selling didn't grow. It was pretty, pretty flat. And the indicators uh, from Q1 reports of this year were showing that it looks like it's uh, it's it might actually go into a little bit more of a decline this year. Mm. You know, it's it. I think direct selling companies are not immune from these challenges, and definitely, I think are are feeling some of the hit that retail is feeling. What are some of the key lessons you think that uh, that direct selling as a channel really needs to learn to get kind of back into growth? Well, I think it's some of the things we just talked about over the last 20 minutes. I think one is the focus on the product. I recall uh, last year being at one of the conferences and um, Gary V talked to the audience about his perspective on direct selling. And his his assessment was that as an industry, we aren't focused enough on product. Right. I don't I don't know if I could necessarily make that statement. I don't know enough about the other direct selling companies I, I observe and nor do I want to cast any aspersions, but I would say a, a focus on product, right? And product differentiation. We're in a market now where products are much easier to get. And if you think about the hallmarks of direct selling, I think back in the day when, you know, someone visited with my mother, whether they were selling the Kirby or they were selling Amway or a better example, or Mary Kay or, you know, uh, Avon, right? 
a lot of those things were, uh, you know, community audience sales, things you felt like maybe you couldn't get at the retailer and so on and so forth. And now with the, the advent of Amazon and whatnot, like everything's online, right? There's hard not to point to what you can't get online and deliver it within a 24 to 48 hour time period. So that's, that's one to focus on product two would be what you do every day to focus on data, right? Making data driven decisions, uh, is extremely important. And, and I think maybe yesteryear, indirect selling, there was so much around, and, and I want to be careful how I say this because this is still needed, but so much around motivation, inspiration, personal development. Yes, yes, yes. Still do those things, but you must add data to the mix to understand are those things making a difference in the manner and form you're currently doing them, or do you need to make adjustments to do them differently? Yeah, that's true. I think a lot of companies look at, you know, they just focus mostly on anecdotal evidence and they think that it's empirical. You know, they, they, you speak to maybe three or four leaders in the field and they all tell you, all three of them tell you the same thing. And you assume that all X hundred thousand of your people must be feeling the same way. And that's a really kind of dangerous assumption to make, especially knowing that leaders have a natural bias and a completely different perspective than the people that are not, which is the right. vast majority. Mm -hmm. And um, I see a lot of companies, you know, just kind of taking leader feedback, which is valuable. It's not to say it's not valuable at all, but but um, it is definitely not all that you need. And like you were saying, you know, like uh, just like the Legal Shield Law Index, you know, what people say they're going to do, like sentiment and what they report they will do versus what they actually do is, right. is oftentimes very, very different. And, and, you know, there's a lot of competition in this space. I mean, re recently, this funny story happened to me the other day, and just to, I did, to put this all into a, a real life perspective of how good e-commerce is at using data and marketing and direct marketing, really, to kind of get to a person that they think wants their product and get them to buy it. I mean, I found myself buying some kind of revolutionary laundry detergent on Facebook the other day. And I was right. like, why did these guys target me? How did they know that like I was the nerd that was going to buy this like super techie, cool laundry detergent? And here I am like dropping 65 bucks. And, right. and it just kind of blew my mind at like how good these marketers are these days at finding a person that is like in that right state. That's the exact right person at the exact right time that wants that thing. Like, and throw it in front of them, they buy it. It's amazing. Exactly. Exactly. So let's move a little bit into getting to know you. Um, I know a lot of people in the industry don't know who you are. I've I've had the the privilege of getting to know you, and you know we moderated a panel a couple of months ago that you did a great job on. And uh, tell us a little bit about about you, James. You know we see a lot of executives in this space burning the candle on both ends, you know, kind of running around. <laughs> I know you do a lot of travel, right? You're going back and forth to Ada a lot, you know, and, and you're kind of all over the country. How do you kind of keep all that into perspective? You, do you have any, any practices on like how you find balance in your life that have made a difference for you? Uh, absolutely. So, you know, first and foremost, uh, you know, married 21 years, uh, uh, a couple weeks to my best friend, Aisha, or so. Uh, we we're both born and raised out of the city of Philadelphia. We live right outside of Philadelphia now in Wilmington, Delaware. Grew up in Philadelphia and through a course of careers, you know, got into, you know, corporate life, et cetera. And I guess to your first point is, is that balance and keeping things in perspective. A lot of times we used to talk about work-life balance and I, I'm really a fan of more of the, the slogan of work-life integration, right? So what's, what works extremely well for me is when I can live into my passions and, you know, my passions are, uh, I'm also an author, uh, and I talk about this in the first part of my book, is you know helping other people be successful, music and technology. And the good news is two of those, one and three, helping people be successful in technology, I get to do in my job every day. Helping associates achieve and become new entrepreneurs puts me in a good place. Helping and being out, speaking about our brand and speaking about the needs of folks and resolving those needs of the 100 million people who need access to the legal system is really uh, uh, good for me and keeps me in a good space. So work feels sometimes less like work. Is it still work and, and drives me crazy sometimes? Absolutely. The second thing is I keep my hobbies going and I think that keeps me in a good place. So I still, I write, I, I did the first book when I was at Chase and it was released. Uh, let me think about it right after I left all state and got here, I'm working on another one or two, so I do that. I still do music. Um, I used to at one point host radio shows and produce uh, records and things like that. So I don't have a studio and do that stuff anymore, but still have a small setup, do some stuff, still be engaged. Uh, and I own a uh, online media company as well, property focused on the genre of music that I love dearly. And, and that's really it. you know. And I spend a lot of time giving back. So whether it's 
local church, whether it's spending time mentoring people, so on and so forth. I feel like giving back, uh, you get more when you give back. You don't realize it at the time, but you you are the primary benefactor uh, in most cases when you're giving back. And and those are the things that kind of keep me to your question kind of on point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. And if you want to send uh, some of the links to your books and stuff, we'll put it in the podcast notes if people want to check it out. we Will do. Yeah. It, you know, it, uh, just a quick side note here, because you said something that I've realized about Legal Shield that I think is really interesting is that, you know, you guys have executives that are kind of based all over the place. We do. And so you're kind of like partly a distributed team. Then you kind of and my understanding is that you guys come together and then come back apart a lot. How does that work out for you guys? I mean, a lot of people kind of have there's a big kind of push for a lot of more remote working and and that kind of stuff these days. You guys seem to have a pretty interesting system for how you handle that. Right. So our CEO, Jeff Bell, uh, is from uh, lives out in Seattle, Washington. And then a number of his direct reports are outside of Ada, Oklahoma as well. So we have a strong contingent of his directs in Ada, strong contingent outside. And, and what we've come up with is we alternate weeks working from home in other places we're traveling and then a week in Ada. Right. And we just uh, alternate back and forth. And I think what makes it work, because I've like you, I've seen so many different uh, environments where uh, different working things is is culture. Right. And openness, transparency, candor, accountability and extreme ownership. Right. And so we've gotten to a place, I believe, and, I, you know, if other team members on the phone, I'd, I'd welcome to join. I think they would support the statement, though, where the relationships and culture has matured to a point where whether we're in the room or not, we still get the same outcomes. Right. So we can we can problem solve actively, dial each other up, jump on video uh, and do a video call, Skype, whatever. But our communications don't slow down because we're not in the same building or on the same floor. Right. And that's become critically important. And I think by doing that and us achieving it, we're also seeing it start to happen with our teams uh, that report to us as well. And so it's really hard nowadays, right, not to think about distributed teams and everyone not being in the same room. Right. Um, and so we uh, we've worked really hard at it. And I think we've uh, achieved a lot. Yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, you guys are starting from the key element, which is you've got a a really important social mission behind the company that really drives people to feel like they're a part of something that is bigger than just like a dollar, right? Right. And then, you know, Jeff was on the podcast a while ago, you know, great leader, really charismatic, really cares about people, you know, from there down kind of seems to trickle a really interesting kind of culture of transparency where you guys can just kind of talk to each other and you can confide in each other and trust each other no matter where you happen to be. And so that, that sounds like a really amazing, amazing uh, place to be at. Right. So going, going back into the you side of things, it sounds like you, you know, you've got a lot of passions and, and making a difference really is a, a big thing for you. So let's imagine that you could place an ad on the internet that had like some kind of message that you could give to everyone that goes online tomorrow. Hmm. What would that ad on the internet say or what would it, what would it do? Legal ignorance is not bliss. <laughs> and it'd just be a link to get our mobile app and use the free components of it to get advice and be mindful. It's so interesting because people... When they think of legal services, say, hey, I'm not a bad person. I didn't do anything wrong. That's not the point. The point is, unfortunately, most things you will do in your life, transactions, uh, you need to get something fixed that has a warranty. They won't honor it. You got landlord tenant issues. I, I mean, I could just, you know, the fact to your point that there's 70 unique areas of law and I don't even want to scare you, but I'll just have to tell you underneath <laughs> that we have to do subcategories. Right. Really? So, <laughs> <laughs> right. So, oh, man. That should just tell you about how much stuff you're doing in the course of the day that you just don't think about. Right. And so getting advice and counsel. So. So, yeah, if I had to do it in, in Twitter talk, 140 characters or less, it'd be, <laughs> legal ignorance is not bliss. Click here. <laughs> <laughs> I would actually run that just to test it, man. Yeah, you guys should probably throw that out and just see what happens. That's, that's pretty funny. That's a good one. Is there, it's, you said that you like to give back and, and to church and other causes. Is, is there a particular charity that is really special to you or close to your heart? Um, you know what? Um, or a cause in general? Generally speaking, it's, it's youth related causes, right? Um, I, the youth in our country, unfortunately, many of them don't have the resources they need, um, whether it's mentorship, sponsorship, guidance. We all know schools years ago started taking out a lot of the extracurricular programs. And so if you think about their circle of influence, it's been greatly diminished. Right. And so I love investing and in giving back uh, both time and resources to things that are going to help youth and give them the opportunity. 
Yeah, it's funny. I was, I've been a big brother for about, I don't even know now, 15 years. It's been, sometimes I wonder, you know, who's getting the better end of the stick, you know, me or him. <laughs> right. Because, <laughs> you know, my experience, you know, has learned, I've learned, learned so much and, you know, it definitely isn't always easy and, you know, you can't really, it's, I've learned that I can't set expectations for myself on that. I've got to just kind of let it be what it's going to be. Right. But so rewarding and in, in, in so many different ways. If you could go back, James, to any time in your life, meet yourself, you know, just kind of walk right up to yourself at that moment in your life and, you know, kind of give yourself a piece of advice. Mm. When would you go back to and what advice would you give yourself? Wow, man, you didn't prep me for that one. Um, (laughs) hmm. So, you know, um, I I had a, a... challenging experience when I lost my father younger in my life. Well, I was eight, 17, 18. I can't go into the whole story, but the, the bottom line is even before he had passed away, he was out of my life uh, for a bunch of different reasons. And I didn't have the connection with him I wanted. And after that, it kind of threw me into a tailspin of um, not having the confidence in myself I should. And I would say, if anything, I would have caught myself around 19 and 20 and have instilled that um, there are, there's a higher source that's taking care of you in absence of your father and let your faith be your guide and, and ride that wave. Right. So that's why I would have grabbed myself by the shoulders around the age of 19 or so. Good news is I have wonderful mentors and people that helped and, and uh, get me, keep me on the right path and so on and so forth. But that, that probably would have been that moment. It's funny. You know, I, I have a very similar one for me. It's about the exact same age and, uh, and I, I was in rebellion against my dad. And so I, I my, my, I, no matter what he said, it was automatically wrong. <laughs> and I would have kind of done it's pretty much the same thing, shake my shoulders. And, but instead of just being like, just listen to the guy a little bit. He's not always wrong about everything. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Either, exactly. Well, thanks a lot, man. It's really, really great to get to know you more. And, and thank you for sharing some of the experiences of, of your life and uh, some of the stuff you guys are learning and doing. And you guys are really driving a, a progressive business there at Legal Shield. And um, I'm sure our audience is, of executives is going to get a lot of value from getting to know you. And uh, I know we'll stay in touch and maybe we'll do an update sometime soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me and uh, continued success to you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. 